Those who know the Savior will gladly testify how God's word brought conviction the hour they met Christ. It may have been a still small voice, but they heard the Master's call. Learning in that moment when they surrendered all, God's word changes lives. His power cannot be denied. The lost find salvation, the foolish become wise. God's word changes lives. The essence of his message, the truth has never changed. God so loved he gave his son that sinners could be saved. And whether read or priest or sung, once it has been heard, the authority of Scripture will leave no heart unstirred. God's Word changes lives. His power cannot be denied. The lost find salvation. The foolish become wise. God's word changes lives. So church of God proclaim his truth till every soul has heard the power of the gospel in God's unchanging word. Unchanging word. God's word changes lives. His power become wise. God's word changes lives. God's word changes lives. God's word changes lives. Well, I got the switch on. There we go. You can't deny I'm on. Amen. All right. I love that song. That was really appropriate. Thank you so much, Sister Pam. Today, we want to speak on the subject of for the word's sake. So if you got your Bible, hold it up. Let me see it. Amen. That's a beautiful sight. God bless you. Now may the word hold you up. All right. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we get started, we pray for a hush to come over us that the Spirit of God provides. Thank you, dear Father, for that after the busy holiday season, which gave us an opportunity, of course, to let our light shine, not just our outside lights or our Christmas tree lights, but to let our spiritual lights shine. And we do pray, Lord, you might do some work on the wick. We might be uh, burning a little low now. We need you to trim our wick, feed the flame, help us to burn bright in 2017, and just use this service to help us Thank you again for the precious Bible. May you use it now through the precious Holy Spirit, who also presents a precious Savior, Jesus Christ. To all this end, we ask your help. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The Apostle John, by the time he wrote the book of Revelation, was an old man. He was the last of the remaining disciples, part of the original twelve, and according to tradition, he never was martyred like the others. And so this man was able to complete his life by doing one more gigantic thing at the very end, and that was to receive the revelation of Jesus Christ. But before we get into that, we want to think about John's life in the three stages that comprise everyone's life, 
the early years, the middle years, and the later years. We find those three snapshots in his writings. And so let's take some reference points. Now, we know in the Gospel of John, he refers to himself in John 21, 24 as the disciple which testifieth of these things. And so John was still a young man at that time. And he was a part of the original school of disciples of our Savior. And he calls himself a fellow learner. I am a fellow learner trying to master the basics of the Christian life just like you. Then in his epistles, he describes himself as an elder. We see this in 2 John 1, 3 and John 1. And you know, elder? Elder? Does that mean some old guy always? It could, but actually it never means a young man. So we know that it also includes middle age, and basically that's the period of time that he used it in his middle years, maybe getting a little gray hair. But in that period of time of his life, he's a spiritual leader. He calls himself an elder, which means that he was a pastor, and he calls himself a spiritual leader with special gifts and privileges and responsibilities. Now, as we move the time frame ahead, we see him in his later years, where he humbly describes himself, as we see right here in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 9, where he says, brother and companion. Brother and companion of the seven churches. And we don't know who those members were. We don't have their names. They're not... uh, famous in the world's circles. They're known to the Lord. But here John says, I'm just one of you guys. So John says that in the early years, he learned a lot. In the middle years, he led a lot. But in those final years, he says, I was just like them a lot. Yeah, we learn a lot, lead a lot, and we all are like each other. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a good way to look at your life. Wrap up the life that God has given you with identification with all your fellow believers. As you know, John was the only apostle who did not die, according to tradition, a violent death. Oh, they tried to. Tradition says that when he was at Rome, that Emperor Domitian lowered him into a cauldron of boiling oil. And when he should have been deep fried, he was lifted out of that cauldron without any scathing burning to his flesh. It was clearly a miracle, and it had a startling effect on all those who witnessed it. And so, if you can't boil them, break them. And they shipped him off to the Isle of Patmos. Now, that was no uh, Caribbean cruise. He wasn't on board there enjoying sumptuous food and playing shuffleboard. He was probably dressed in prison garb, probably shackled with chains, stuck down in the hull of the ship along with a hundred other guys. And so he's not going to some fantasy island. He's going to a prison island, something like Alcatraz. He's going to a rocky, barren, isolated island where the empire's most notorious criminals are kept. Now, it's not a very big island. I read that it probably was about eight miles long, five miles wide. Many of us have driven greater distances to get here to church. And so here on this island were all these 'er ne'er-do-wells, and there was one of the best men on the face of the earth mixed in with them. Now, It's worth noting that John was sent to Patmos with the intention that that be his final destination. When he stepped off the boat, it was the end of the journey for him. At least it was supposed to be. But of course we know it really was the beginning of the fantastic visions of Revelation. So many a time we feel like we're coming to the end of our lives. But you don't know that. God may be preparing you for the greatest uh, spiritual adventure of your life. And so you can't look at things 
according to the surface appearance. You have to really think about what God may be setting you up for. Now, we know that this has been, happened to other men in similar circumstances, how God has used them when they were supposed to just kind of like live out the rest of their life in complete ugliness and boredom. We know that uh, the uh, famous preacher John Bunyan, uh, back in the 17th century, was sent to his final destination, which was the Bedford County Jail. And he spent 12 long years in there, and unlike the other prisoners, he busied himself writing a story, which we now know is The Pilgrim's Progress, a literary masterpiece. And that particular man, he didn't notice those 12 years. He was able to uh, fly free through his imagination and experience high drama, a great spiritual adventure which depicts the Christian life. If only we had eyes to see it. And so just be aware of this, that God can turn a hospital room into spiritual walks with God. That God can turn low-income housing into high-output ministry. And by the way, low-income housing to John in these circumstances would look something like uh, the Holiday Inn with all the accommodations. So if John could be successful where he was, so can you. Now... I want you to think about this. It says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Verse 10. Isn't that the most important thing? It's not the room. It's being in the Spirit, not in the room. Where was John? Under a tree, if they had trees. Just out in the, in the hot sun. Maybe in a cave. You know, it was... It had several volcanic peaks on that island. It was created by volcanoes. Maybe he was just sitting on top of a, of a again, top of a rocky peak. Maybe he was inside a dark, damp cave. At any rate, didn't matter where on the island he was. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. What kind of frame of mind are you in right now? Are you thinking about where you're going to eat when you get out of here? What you're going to watch on television? What you're going to do with your family? You're not in the spirit. You should be giving God your undivided attention, just like John was. And so here he was. And the Bible does tell us right here that he was there for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, verse 9. He was there for the word of God and the testimony of Christ. Now, what does John mean when he says that he was on Patmos for the word's sake? Well, he was there because he was faithful to the word of God. And therefore, because he would not deny those few scattered manuscripts that basically were forming themselves by God's hand into the New Testament, he had to go to that island. John allowed himself to be shipped off to a barren, rocky little island seemingly out in nowhere just for the testimony of the scriptures? He suffered miserable living conditions, lonely isolation for a collection of newly formulated Christian writings? Yep, he practiced what he preached. You remember John in his writings said that we had to keep the commandments to prove our love to the Savior. In fact, did you know that the word Commandments appears 14 times in the five chapters of 1 John. So John had been teaching this for many years, that if you really love the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to keep his commandments. And so John here gets the opportunity to basically practice what he preaches. I believe John could have received a ticket off of Patmos anytime he wanted if he simply would have given in to the demands of the emperor and denied his Savior and the scriptures that taught about him. But that is the foundation of our faith. That is something he could not do. He esteemed the word more than his only fleshly comfort, than his own ambitions, than his own needs. He didn't just estimate the scriptures out of his own prejudice to be that important. He knew from personal experience it's that important. 
You remember what David said in Psalm 119.72? He said, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. David had thousands of gold and silver. He knew what it could do. But he said, you know what? I've already found out from personal experience that the word of God does way more for me than all of my wealth. Have you found that out? Do you really think that your money and your good stuff is really going to be better to you than what God will be through his word? The authorities, no doubt, attempted to bribe John. No doubt, they were tempting him with liberty and luxury. But he said, you can keep it. I'll keep the word. You keep your liberty and luxury. And that kind of stuff without the scriptures and without the Savior is a curse, not a blessing. So you can have it. Reminds me of Daniel, you know, when he had to interpret the handwriting on the wall. And the king says, now, if you interpret this, I'll give you all these, all these uh, jewels. I'll give you a gold chain and nice clothes to put on. He says, keep it for yourself. But I'll tell you what it says. I don't need it. And so, in our own humble way, we need to prove by experience that the Bible is not for sale. That we will not fit the Bible into our lifestyle, but we will conform our lifestyle to the Bible because it's more valuable. Nothing reveals our evaluation of truth like suffering. Nothing. Five minutes of our suffering for the word means more to God than five hours of studying the word and more than five days of ministry with the word. Suffering really meets God's approval when the reason you're suffering is because you want to obey the Bible. The Lord says that suffering counts for righteousness. That suffering counts for reward because that suffering is done for my word. And so that's why he was on the island. I remember what Eliphaz rightly observed. He said, now man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Chapter 5, verse 7 of Job. So if we're all destined to suffer anyway, why don't we make it count? Right? The sparks are going to fly upward. If you're on this earth, you're destined to suffer. So just make it count. Just make sure you make it count. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. You know, it's interesting how much we can suffer as long as we don't break our spirit. You know, John, I imagine the other prisoners came to him and said, Hey, buddy, how is it you even smile? You seem to be so much at peace. You seem to have a purpose and joy. None of us have that. And so, you know, it's amazing that in the Bible, the worst bro brokenness is the spirit brokenness. And so we associate brokenness with bones. But you can get your bones all broken, but if your spirit's not broken, you'll heal and be fine. And so, again, God shows us that the most painful breakings is the breakings of the spirit. And that's when your attitude gets snapped in sorrow snapped in sorrow. There is no better example of this, really, of the healing power of a healthy spirit like John had on Patmos, like all great men have had, than the Super Bowl, which is about to take place in a few weeks. And I don't want you to stay home to watch the Super Bowl. This is not my endorsement of the Super Bowl as a substitute for coming to church. But I want to say it's a great object lesson because the Apostle Paul talked about the Olympics in his day. And so sports often illustrates the importance of your priorities, even though theirs is not the right one still. The biggest sporting event in North America is the Super Bowl. Now, players on both sides of the ball are going to suffer fatigue and bruises and bleeding. Sometimes they're stuffing cotton up their nose because they got bloody noses. All kinds of scrapes and bruises and bang-ups. But the winning team will endure, endure pain better and heal faster because they are so happy from winning. And the losing team will suffer more, even from less injuries, and heal more slowly, even though they have the same good medical care because they suffer defeat. 
And so a broken body of suffering combined with a broken spirit of sorrow is a crushing, unbearable burden. If you see yourself as a winner more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ, when you get hurt, you will heal faster. If you see yourself as a struggling, defeated Christian, then you will heal very slowly, if at all. Oh, how important this is. And of course, in a Super Bowl game, what's the most important thing? First of all, it ticks on a clock. If the, if the two teams are coming down to the two-minute warning and they're just separated or tied, perhaps they're separated by a field goal or maybe they're tied. Now, every tick of those two minutes is precious. Also, what else is precious? Opportunities are precious. What if right at the last two minutes, the other team fumbles and they recover the ball? Now they have a new opportunity. Opportunities are precious. What else is precious? Don't break the rules. What if you score a touchdown in the last 60 seconds and then the touchdown is rescinded because somebody on your team broke the rules and they call the ball back? That could cost you the game. And so time is precious. Opportunities are precious. And the rules are precious because nobody is said to be a winner unless you keep the rules. See how important all this is? If we really value our short, brief time on this earth, it is very precious. We can't win without the ticks of the clock. Every opportunity that we get, we'll grab it because those are precious. And we understand, too, that we have to live by the Bible. We can't win on our terms. We have to win on the Bible's terms. If God someday says, welcome home, good and faithful servant, it's because we played by the book. you got to do that. And so this is so important for all of us to remember. The Apostle John was having those kind of thoughts as he spent his last years, he thought, on the Isle of Patmos. Now, if you notice in verse 9 of Revelation 1, where it says, I, John, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Did you notice that he puts two reasons together into one? He says, I'm here on this island because of the word of God. I won't stop preaching it. I won't deny its truths. I'm also here because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm a believer. And the emperor, right now, he's persecuting us. So, two reasons, and they are inseparable. John is putting these two together, and they go together. You remember, John is the one who made the connection in John chapter 1. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, John 1, 1 and 2. And in verse 14, we see he does the same exact thing. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we see that there is the uh, written word and the living word. So you can't honor the one without the other. If you in any way fail in the one, you fail in the other. We must never forget that what God has joined together, man is not to put asunder. The written word without the living word is pointless, powerless, and profitless. Christ is the theme of the Bible. Christ is the substance of the Bible. Christ is the goal of the Bible. If you really love the written word, you have to love the living word too. If you are faithful to the written word, then you are faithful to the living word. If you suffer for the written word, it's just as if you're suffering for the living word. You know, how you treat your Bible is how you treat Jesus. If you don't listen to me right now, and I'm trying to teach the Bible, it's really you're not listening to Jesus. Imagine now. Imagine if a married couple who deeply love one another, very devoted to one another, the, uh, the man has to go away on a trip. And... Um, he writes a letter to his wife. After a few days, the letter comes in the mail. She is going through the letters. And through, she got through the post, post box there. He said, oh, I got a letter from my husband. And she throws it on the table. She doesn't bother to read it right away. I'll read it later. What does that say about her feelings toward her husband? It should be the first thing she reads. 
She should devour that letter, reread and reread and reread, because she loves her husband. And so that's the way it is with the Bible. When you get up in the morning, are you excited to read your Bible? If you are, that translates to a good relationship with Jesus Christ. You, you and him are really intimate. But if you can just, oh, I'll, I'll read that later. I'll do that later. You're putting Jesus off. You are willing to postpone a talk with Jesus. I assure you, he is noticing that. The point that I want you to understand is this. It is the written word that is a blessing to you. But if it wasn't for the Savior who opens it to you, you wouldn't know a stinking thing. <laughs> it's like the two men on the road to Emmaus. They had the word already, but Jesus opened it up to them and made their hearts burn with excitement. And so it's, that's the way it is. Christ is the key to the treasures of the Bible. And so you need the, the key, but Christ is also the treasure chest. He is both key and treasure chest. As it says in Colossians 2.3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Well, all our discoveries are really his revelations. Sometimes we want to pat ourselves on the back for what we saw in the Bible. What you saw was what Jesus showed you. We should be less impressed with our discoveries and more impressed with his revelations. We're like a family of mice that lived in an old grand piano. They were always curious about the beautiful tones that came floating to their ears. One day, one of them scampered into the sound case and discovered these long cables that vibrated with rich tones. He quickly ran back to his family and says, I have made a great discovery. I know where the beautiful sounds are coming from. I went into this big room and there are these long cables that vibrated. All the mice were sure that this was the answer. Until one day another mouse, scampering around, discovered little hammers that were striking the cables. And he quickly ran back and said, No, I know why these beautiful tones are being made in our little area. It's because I discovered a row of hammers striking the little cables. And so they all said, This is the real reason why we hear such beautiful tones. And for the rest of their lives, they watched the little sturdy hammers. They timed the hammers. They measured the hammers. They marked when the hammer struck, but they were never aware of the master's hands that went up and down the keyboard, making the hammers work. What the old grand piano was to the mice, the old good book is to us. There is an unseen hand operating on the chapters and verses of the Bible. There are 88 keys on a piano, connected to 220 strings that operate 58 tones. Listen to this. They would be dead silent without the touch of the master's hand. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible, which are holding 31,102 verses, which in turn hold 783,137 words. And they would not say a single thing to your heart without the touch of the master's hand. We owe more to Jesus Christ than we think. It is he who sent the Holy Spirit to this earth. He works for him. And so it's interesting to know that the third person of the Trinity is doing the work of the second person of the Trinity to make music out of your Bible which comforts you and inspires you. As we close this morning, remember that how you treat your Bible is how you treat your Savior. The time you spend in your Bible is really the time you want to spend with your Savior. That when you honor and support and obey the Bible, you are honoring and supporting and obeying your Savior that whatever you discover in your Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ to you. John received revelations that completed God's written word. You know what? We receive old revelations. 
but again with new insight and new blessing and new appreciation. And we should be just as excited as John was on the day the revelation started. If we don't recognize the master behind these discoveries, the music will stop. You will one day open your Bible, and it won't say a real meaningful thing to you. You can say, well, I read my chapter for the day, but there was no music to your heart. Just be well aware that if we don't honor the Savior of the Scripture, then there's going to be, a, I guess, a removal of the hands. Remember this verse in Psalm 28.5? Listen to this verse in Psalm 28.5. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. You have to see that the Bible is God's book. That the Bible, as that verse says, is the work of the Lord. This is not made by men. This is a God-breathed, God-made inspired in the original manuscripts and preserved for us in the King James Version. But that verse goes on to say, nor the operation of his hands. Now God's going to use this book. He's going to use this book providentially to speak to you. And if you in turn don't ever say thank you, don't ever show appreciation, guess what? This verse says that God has the right to destroy you. He takes great offense to that. We thank Jesus Christ, God incarnate, for operating through his word for our sake. When we have an invitation, you ought to come down and thank Jesus Christ for speaking to you today and speaking to you tomorrow. Just say, Lord, I have been enjoying these revelations without really crediting where they're coming from. And the last thing I want you to really stop and think about today. Again, John was on the Isle of Patmos. Will you turn your Patmos into the door of the greatest adventure of your life? Now think about this. Many times we stop to think that I'm in a wilderness, and I don't like being in the wilderness. I wish I wasn't in a wilderness, but I'm in a wilderness. Are you in the wilderness with, the G with Jesus Christ, or are you in the wilderness all by yourself? If you're in the wilderness because you wandered off, then you're in a bad way because you're not only in the wilderness, you're all by yourself. But if you're in the wilderness because God puts you in the wilderness, and he's with you right by your side, as the Bible says, the Lord knows the way that I take. He will be right there with me. It's so cool to think that Jesus Christ accompanies us. And if I can have his presence, I don't care if it's a wilderness. I don't care if it's, it's a Patmos. That doesn't matter. It's, will he be with me? That's what matters. You know, uh, there was a lady in church who seemed to forget this. And she was sitting there, and she was tired. And so, can you believe this? She fell asleep right when the offering was being taken. She dropped her chin on her chest and started sleeping. After a few moments, she felt a gentle hand on her shoulder. It was the usher with the offering plate. She looked at the hand and saw there was a nail print in it. And she looked up at the face, and it was Jesus Christ holding the offering plate. Wow. I thought, that's powerful. Do you realize that the Lord Jesus not only observes everything, he's actually operating the show. He enables the ushers to take the offering as he enables me to preach. It's Jesus' power operating everything, just as if he were doing it all by himself. Do you believe that? That makes everything to be very serious, that you want to do the best you can for Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. and just.